good morning, and, and let me start by saying that Estonians are liars, because you may have heard that, um, that we are introverted, that we don't talk to strangers, that we look at our own shoes when we're talking to other people. And that's mostly true, but it's not true when we're talking about e-government. Then we can talk and talk and talk and go on and on. And we violate the once-only principle. We talk about the once-only principle over and over and over again. So I want to apologize in advance for this false advertising. Um, we have a problem, I think, collectively, everyone in this room, all the policymakers, the private sector vendors, the consultants who deal with e-government. Our work is pretty boring. I mean, really. You know, e-government, e-governance, even the title, it's not very sexy. And, and you can tell these great stories about the impact of digital transformation. You can talk about the billions or the millions saved, reducing government bloat, cutting down on corruption. But you know what? Uh, there are a lot of people who promise that, and it gets repetitive, and we've heard about new public management, we've heard about all these different ways of achieving these outcomes. And then you start talking about the technical stuff, say interoperability, semantics, reference architecture, service levels to a politician. Talk about you know, PKI, two-factor authentication, about you know, Oracle versus SAP, service design methodologies, database formats, and they're just going to go like this, and they're going to fall asleep. So this has been a problem for us for quite a while here. Um, and, and once only, effectively, it's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that if we talk about the results in a very simple, really an oversimplified way, we can get around some of that boredom, and we can make the goal and the benefits more concrete for businesses, for citizens, of everything that we're doing collectively in e-government. And I don't think that once only as a, as, a, as a term does that perfectly, but we think it gets us in that direction. So in a nutshell, it's a binary quality benchmark. You have once only or you don't. And the idea is really to get away from all the complexity to something very simple. So if the government has a piece of information, a piece of data about you, they don't ask it from you again. They reuse what they have. And in Estonia, this has been part of our law on, uh, on public information for, uh, for basically a decade now. Um, where basically what the law says is that if you have a public sector database, that has a piece of information, data, you cannot have another database that has the same data. It has to point back to that original database. Um, and if you, as a public administration, want to set up a new information system, then you have to go through a review process. And if the, sort of, if the review of that service, we look at you know, your data objects, we map it semantically, if the review says, that data already exists somewhere within all of what the public sector has, then the process goes back to you and says, nope, you're not allowed to build the system. You can't connect it to our interoperability architecture. You've got to go talk to the people who have that data and get them to give you access to it within the context of the laws and, and the sort of the rules that the public administration follows, et cetera. Now, it's not really that easy. It's not just as easy as writing a piece of law and then everything happens. Of course, behind that is having all the technical interoperability, having what in our case in Estonia we call X-Road, having an electronic identity system, having all of those processes work, as well as the hard work of getting the public administration to actually follow it. But again, that's boring, that's in the background. What this means in practice is pre-filled tax declarations, companies that don't have to hold on to boxes of papers or their approvals that they've gotten from permitting or, or even the digital equivalent stored somewhere in the cloud because the information's in public registers. It means doctors who have your medical history, your diagnoses, but also you know, the boring things like your medical billing data already available for you so you don't have to bring that with you to the doctor. It means public agencies that don't go back to you and say, what is your legal address? Because they know what your legal address is if you come to them with a the problem. It means you know, permitting for a public demonstration that takes a few minutes instead of hours of paperwork. And it means you can start a new business in 15 minutes. So this, of course, isn't just about convenience and saving a little bit of time. It's also good for rule of law. It's also good for transparency. When the government reuses the data that it has, it forces everyone to make sure the data is correct. I mean, if you give the data, if, if, you, if you have to apply for, I don't know, a license, and the government wants a bunch of information about you, but you know they're just going to, they just have to give you that license, and then you're happy, and that data is going to sort of go away and, and will never be relevant again, 
you don't worry so much about making sure everything's correct, that your legal address is right, that your company history is right. But if the government reuses that data over and over and over again, you really want to make sure it's right. And the government wants to make sure it's right. And so once we actually start implementing the once-only principle, it has a whole bunch of follow-on effects. And it becomes an enabler for a lot of the other interesting types of things you can do in e-government. Everything from you know, coming up with data analytics that catch tax fraud to offering what we're now working on in Estonia, which is a goal of, of zero bureaucracy, that effectively, if you're a small business, you don't have to worry about filing taxes, you don't have to worry about permitting, it happens in the background. In short, the once-only principle becomes a simple litmus test. It's an abstraction, and it hides the qualitative aspects of good government, good e-government, behind this very simple principle. It asks you, all of us who actually have to provide the once-only principle, have you actually figured out your interoperability? Not just your technical interoperability, you know, using the same protocols. Do you have semantic interoperability? Do your ontologies really match? And if you have a data object, do you treat it the same way in different services? How about your organizational interoperability? Do, do, does your agency, does the police and does the population register, do they really understand things in the same way? And are the business processes aligned? Do you have an architecture for exchanging this data? Is that architecture secure? Are your data management practices good? And you could go on and on and on. You have to solve all of these questions to make once only work. But the beauty of it is, the politicians don't know about it. They just know that you're offering them once only. The citizens, the businesses, they see the results of the services. And so you can boil down this complex work into a simple one-line benchmark. Now, the, the sad news in all of this is you don't get a lot of awards and plaudits for doing this. It becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that the businesses and the citizens become ever more demanding. So the experience we've had in Estonia is that mostly the public discussion on e-government is how bad it is. Because people will always think of that one service that doesn't live up to these principles that requires them to resubmit data that is a little bit less convenient than it could be. And I see some Estonian heads here nodding that it's actually quite frustrating. So the bad news is delivering doesn't always make your life much easier. Um, I should also say that I'm, I'm, when we talk about Estonia, I'm quite, I feel quite modest talking about these things because a lot of the people who are behind what I just described and a lot of the work we've done in the last 15 years are in the room. So, in fact, if, if some of them will show their hands, uh, we have Rein and Ivar here who have, have worked on a lot of the legal aspects. I see Uno Wallner, who effectively is behind this entire sort of semantic process. Riho Ox, who I don't know if he's in the room, did a lot of the, the implementation work to get the technical side to work. And we have Janak here, who's actually pushing the once only principle forward right now. I hope you can talk to all of them. And there are some others I haven't mentioned during discussions. Now, you may get the impression that Estonians somehow invented the once only principle, and that's not true. Serge and Maria have told you a lot about what's going on in Europe. Our Dutch colleagues, for instance, have been working on this for more than 20 years. And in fact, it's actually in some areas, a fairly broadly recognized principle of good administration. So if we talk about pre-filled tax returns, um, there's a pretty long list of countries that offer at least partially pre-filled tax returns. You know, many European countries, but also Chile, Singapore, South Africa, and the list gets longer every year. And if we look at other areas, you see a lot of public administration trying to start to implement this principle. Now, that's all still nationally. However, if you're Estonia, you're a small, open, trade-dependent country, it's not enough for once only to work, uh, just, to work just in your own country. I mean, Estonians, and I have my ID here somewhere, which I will hold up as a prop. Did I leave it over there? Anyways, it's not so important. I mean, Estonians you know, like to travel a lot. Uh, Estonian companies like to do business elsewhere. And we started by looking at our neighbors. So we have several tens of thousands of Estonians who work in Finland. And for them to get social insurance benefits there, they need to basically get some information from the Estonian government to be put into the database in Finland. Now, Finland has, pretty, has a pretty good e-government ecosystem. Estonia has a pretty good e-government ecosystem. That's been true for a while. In spite of this, they would have to go to the Estonian agency, who would print out all these papers, put a few stamps on it, put it in an envelope, carry the envelope with the ferry over to the Finnish agency, and then the Finnish agency would type all the data into their information systems. So we said, this is a little silly. We're making a lot of job for data entry specialists. Um, so we started working with the Finns now about five years ago. 
um, to start developing, developing a common interoperability architecture and getting those systems to work together. Now, the thing is, it's very easy for us to work with Finland. One country, similar languages, similar procedures, but that's not enough. I mean, I live in Belgium right now, and having great ones only between Finland and Estonia doesn't really help me living in Belgium. Um, I actually had a, a chance when I was in Belgium once to explain to a sort of a non-e-government person what my job is in a very simple way. I was, um, I was signing up for a cell phone contract in, you know, in, in a store, and, uh, and he asks, do I have a, an ID card? Because in Belgium, if you have a Belgian ID card, they put the ID card in the reader and they get your address and they get your data from the sort of various systems using the ID card. So they have one only in Belgium. And I said, well, here's my Estonian card, which is probably sitting somewhere over there, um, and try it. And he tried it and it didn't work. And I said, my job is that one day when you stick my Estonian ID card into that reader, you will get my legal address data as if I were a Belgian. And he said, oh, that's cool. That's a good job. I like it. So voila, um, simple, simple examples. But so this is why the, the European side and ultimately the global side is very important. Um, and and I, so we'll talk a little bit in a second about where that's going to go. But we also have to ask ourselves some tough questions because I think that you know, it's, it's not enough just to be a cheerleader about this. And so I want to ask you three critical questions. The first is, as we talk about once only, we have to be very self-critical about the impact because when we talk about once only, we're not talking about other things. We could be talking about migrating to cloud. We could be talking about service design. We could be talking about using more secure architectures. We need to be sure and we need to, that, that this is a, a sensible way to spend our very limited attention budgets with our bosses, with our politicians, um, with our, our funders, because it might be that while we're focusing on once only, we're leaving a lot of other important goals aside. Second, when we talk about cross-border once only, um, the question remains if we should, how, how much effort we should be doing on a European level versus really focusing on our own backyard. I mean, it is easier to start with the bilateral relationships that you have with your neighboring countries. So for Estonia, that's Finland. For Sweden, that's Denmark. For the UK, it's Ireland. And you could go on. Um, there's a downside to trying to do things on a, a regional or a global level, which is you have to get far many more parties to agree to the same approach. And it takes a lot of time, and there's a lot of inefficiency there. So we always have to be asking ourselves for everything we're doing, is European, is global, is you know, going through international standard setting bodies the best way to do it, or should we maybe take a more agile approach and work with a few neighbors? And finally, I think there's one big question hanging over our head, not just for once only, but more broadly for e-government. Is the public sector the right way to do all of this? Because as we're doing all of this in the background, we've got Facebook, we've got Alibaba, we've got a lot of other companies that have great data exchange platforms, that have global identity systems, and they're not there yet. But in a few years, they're going to be coming, maybe for a few public services, and they're going to be saying, well, I could help you with this. I could be your identity assurance provider. I could help you exchange this data between agencies. And I'm not going to say that that's a good or a bad thing, but we have to realize that there are a broader set of competitors out there and think about what we think about them. And if we want to be in that same business, if we want to divide the market up somehow. But I'm going to leave you with a positive note. And the, the point of the positive note is that actually what, what's going on in Europe now is pretty interesting and it's got a lot of very high level attention. So the, uh, the new president of France, Emmanuel Macron, made e-government a top priority in his political platform. And uh, Angela Merkel said that in the next political sort of term in Germany, if she's re-elected, um, e-government will be one of her number one priorities. And if we get France and Germany agreeing on something, um, then it will basically, they'll pull the rest of Europe with them. Um, we also want to contribute a bit to this um, this year. Uh, in the second half of the year, in about a month, we have the, um, the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union for six months, we as Estonia. Um, and we're going to uh, be bringing together e-government ministers in October to sign a ministerial declaration on e-government, where we're going to take some of the ideas in the e-government action plan, which is a document by the commission, and making our own commitments as governments to support this and to move forward. And I think if we look at the broader global context, um, it's a very interesting time. Um, Europe has been saying that, uh, look, 
Certain countries may no longer believe in open borders and free trade, but by and large, we do. Europe as a whole relies on an open, liberal, international global order, and while most of that is about trade negotiations, some of that is also about e-government, and there's a lot of interesting work that we're doing close to Europe, but also more further afield. And, and I think that as we sort of look at the next five to 10 years, we're going to be doing a lot more of that. All of which is to say, watch this space because I think that you'll be hearing a lot more about once only. I think you'll be hearing about it outside of just a European concept, context. And I hope that it's useful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.